Godinez, licensed professional counselor, the host of We Need to Talk with Chris Godinez, which this is. So, hi. All right, so um, this week's show, we are talking about communication. Let me get all of the disclaimers and everything out of the way. So this video is for educational and informational purposes only. If you feel you need a therapist, please go to Google, type in therapy, your city, Psychology Today will pop up, click on that, and it will have all of the therapists in your area. Also, the views and opinions stated herein are mine and mine alone. They do not represent the ACA, the APA, or any other therapist for that matter. Okay, so, oh, also, announcements. So, uh, the Women's Yoga Retreat is still on at Crown King, Arizona on September 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. Uh, get a hold of Karen Taryn at... Um, the Bradshaw Mountain Guest Ranch. There are still spaces available. I will be presenting on the night of the 23rd. Uh, the, sh the live show with me and Richie is still on. That is September 30th at the uh, Women's Tempe's, Tempe Women's Club at 1290 South Mill. That will start doors open at 630. It is first come, first seated. We have limited seating. It is 135 people. Um, please bring a non-perishable uh, food item that we can donate to St. Mary's Food Bank. So that's that. All right. So tonight's conversation. Huh oddly enough, is on communication. So when I have couples come in and sit down, that is the number one thing that they tell me is that they do not know how to talk to each other. And it is a problem. It seems like in our society, nobody has, we've, we've lost the niceties. We've lost the, uh, you know, learning to listen. We've lost the ability to really listen and to hear people. And when people get into confrontations, it's because they're not being heard. So when voices start raising and people start getting angry, it's because yes, they're angry, but it's also because they don't feel heard. They don't feel respected. So what I want to teach you tonight is a bunch of different communication techniques that you can apply to your relationships and your healthy relationships. So remember, no matter how good of a communicator you are, if you're dealing with somebody who is toxic or is um, a narcissist or you know malignant narcissist, malignant borderlines, you could be the best communicator in the world and it won't work. Uh, hey, Amy. Um, so yeah, so I wanna talk to you guys about how to have healthy communications. All right, so when couples come in and, and talk to me, they are always angry because they're not feeling heard. They're not feeling respected. They're not feeling listened to. For some reason in our society, we don't listen to listen or to hear. We listen to mount a defense worthy of a Supreme Court attorney going up against the Supreme Court. I, I don't know why we do that, but we do. It's like, it's like we're not really hearing what the person is saying. We're not really allowing that to soak in so that we can, you know, make sure that they feel heard. We're listening so that we can go, oh, yeah, well, you do this too. Or, oh, yeah, well, da 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 It's like, whoa, back off, people. So we don't want to do that. So what you want to do is your partner needs to feel heard. You need to feel heard. Both of you need to feel heard. So it's a technique called reflective listening. So in reflective listening, it's going to slow everything way the hell down. And it's going to feel really weird. I can guarantee it because a lot of couples, usually the way an argument goes is bam, well, bam, 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 and it's often running the races, right? So what you want to do is like the Flintstones. It sounds bam, 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 yes. And in some cases, that's how it turns out. But um, so bad. So, um, oh, thank you, Carolyn. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, so you don't want to do that. You want to slow the conversation way down. And it's going to feel really weird, but that's okay. Because guess what? Growth occurs outside of your comfort zone. Growth is over here. Comfort zone is here. You want to go outside of your comfort zone so that you grow and you change. Because if your relationship is not working, doing the same thing over and over and over and over is not going to change it. You got to do something different. So in reflective listening, the way reflective listening works is here's the couple, okay? And let's say that the issue is um, the dishes don't get done. That's a common housework, chores, that seems to be a common thing that couples talk about. So let's say that one part of the couple wants to get the dishes done and the other part of the couple needs to hear it. So in a reflective listening, what you're going to do is you're going to say, okay, and this is a two-parter. Oh, Lord. Okay. So let me explain this. I want you to think about a reverse Oreo cookie. 
Okay. So you know how a regular Oreo cookie is like the hard stuff on the outside, the gooey stuff on the inside and the hard stuff on the outside. I want you to reverse that when you are having to bring up difficult topics. So what you're going to do is when you have to bring something difficult up, like, honey, I don't feel the dishes are getting done. Instead of pulling out the you, 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 you guns, you don't do the dishes. You're a horrible mate. You, you always generalizations. You always leave a mess. You never clean up against yourself. Do you see how I'm shooting the you, 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 you guns? What ends up happening is your partner is going to stop their fingers in their ear and go, la, 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 la. I'm not listening. La, 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 la. Fuck you. La, 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 la. Yeah, they're not going to hear you. So what you want to do is you want to come at it like a reverse Oreo cookie. So in other words, you let your partner know there's an issue that's going to be discussed because generally people don't like conflict. There's a lot of really, you know, people really, really, really want to avoid conflict. But if you bring up the conflict in a softer way, they're going to be more open to hearing it. So what you want to do is you want to do a reverse Oreo cookie. So you start with the soft stuff. Honey, there's a topic I have to bring up, and I, it's not that I think you're a horrible person or anything like that. It's just something that I have to bring up so I make sure our relationship is okay because it's been bothering me. Do you have time to talk right now? Okay, boom, opening. Person knows that something's coming. Then you go into the criticism. Now stay away from you, 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 you. You want to stick to I statements, I statements, I statements. Honey, I feel disrespected when, when the behavior, now you're going to talk about the behavior. I feel disrespected when the dishes don't get done. It just feels disrespectful to me. And then you come up out of that and you leave with the positive takeaway and you're a great person and I love you. And the only reason I'm mentioning this is because I know that this is good for our relationship for us to talk about things that bother us. And I know there's things that I do that bother you too. And I want to know what those are. So thank you for listening to me. I really appreciate it. Now, if the spouse is trained in communication, what they will do is reflective listening. Okay, so you saw how I did the reverse Oreo cookie, right? You saw how I, I got into it gently. It's like, okay, we're going to talk about something a little bit serious. Okay, here's the, here's the serious topic and then end on the positive note. Now, if the spouse is doing reflective listening, what they will do is say, Oh gosh, honey. Okay. So what I heard you say, let me make sure I heard what you said. What I heard you say is that you really want me to do the dishes or you feel that the dishes need to be done because when they're not, I, you feel like I'm disrespecting you in some way. Is that correct? You always ask. It's like, did I get that right? And then the spouse has the chance to say either, yes, that's exactly what I said. Or more often what ends up happening is remember we're listening. We usually don't listen to listen. We usually are listening to mount a defense worthy of a defense attorney. So usually what ends up happening is when a, a criticism comes in, like the, you know, the dishes are not getting done, the person listening will go off on a tangent like, oh yeah, well, da 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 I heard you say that I'm a horrible person and I don't do the dishes and you don't like me and da 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 And that's when you have to kind of stop them and go, whoa, 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 stop. That's not what I said. Let me try again. And then you repeat. And you're going to repeat pretty much word for word what you said the first time, because what's happening is, is your spouse is filtering it through their own filter, which may be clogged with stuff from past relationships, from their family of origin, whatever. You don't know what's clogging that filter. So you have to go back and repeat what was said until the message is absolutely sent and received correctly. Then you switch. And that is the way to have healthy communication. That is a completely different way of talking. That is not how we're trained to talk. We're trained to be defensive. We're trained to shoot the you, 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 you guns. And we're trained to make sure to mount a defense worthy of a defense attorney. And that is not how to have a relationship. So when you are doing reflective listening, now all of this, all of these techniques that I'm teaching you are in this book called Fighting for Your Marriage. And I'll be damned if I can remember who wrote it, but it's called Fighting for Your Marriage as opposed to against your marriage. Fighting for Your Marriage has all of these techniques in it. So, um, so this is a great, this is a great thing to do. So you teach yourself and your spouse how to do reflective listening. And if you cannot remember the reflective listening at the very, very least, remember to do the reverse Oreo cookie. So when you have to talk about difficult topics, always start off on a positive, go into the difficult part and always end with the positive takeaway. 
it's kind of like if you ever watch uh, Adam Ruins Everything, he always does that. He always starts off with kind of like, okay, here's what we're going to talk about, and here's the bad news, and here's the positive takeaway. You want to do that because people are more apt to remember what you have said, and they're going to be more receptive to what you are saying than if you just come out of like, bam, 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 bam. Okay, it is by right. Howard Markman, Scott Stanley, and Susan Bloomberg. So Fighting for Your Marriage by Howard Markman, Scott Stanley, and Susan Bloomberg. Really good book. I really like it. It's just, it's all communication skills. So, okay, so the second half of all of that. So does, does anybody have any questions on reflective listening, how to do it, how to teach it, where to get the information? If anybody does, please, you know, write your thingies and let me know so I can clarify or how to do the reverse Oreo cookie. Okay. So the second part of this is, is that we have a tendency when we get angry is to call names. Don't do it. Don't do it. Healthy communication, healthy relationships, never, and I mean never, have name calls. Ever. I cannot tell you the number of times I have had couples sit down on my couch and say things like, oh, you know, he's such an asshole, and you know, you're a dick, and you're a bitch, and you're a cunt, and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, I'm sorry, y'all, but you know, calling somebody a bitch and an asshole is not a term of endearment. It is not. So knock it off. It's not going to work. So what you want to do is if you're angry, say that you're angry. You can say that. Um, you can you can say, I, I feel very angry. Name your emotion. For some reason in our society, it's like we don't discuss the emotion. So we just go straight to the anger. Remember, anger is not a pure emotion. Anger is always based in fear. So if somebody's angry, it is because they are afraid. What's the best way to teach this skill to children? You just point blank teach it to them. It's like, okay, we're going to play a game. It's called reflective listening. So I'm going to say something and you're going to reflect it back to me. Let's see if we can get the message right. It's kind of like playing telephone. If you guys ever played telephone where you start off at one end and by the time it gets back to the circle, it's a completely different message. That seems to be what happens in our society with communication. So you want to teach children early on how to listen. And when you, when you say, like I've heard some parents say, well, you know, tell me what I just said, but they're saying it in a, in a very, you know, if you don't get it right, I'm going to beat your ass kind of way. Y'all don't want that. Um, so make it a game. It's like, Hey, I was just wondering, can you repeat back to me what I just said, just to make sure that I get that you got it kind of thing. And usually kids are right on with that because to them, it's a game to them. It's something fun. It's like, Oh, yay, let's do this. So, and a respect for kids. I mean, here's the thing. We learn communication skills. Dear God, I am watching a dust storm come in. What the actual Arizona, Oh, wait five minutes. The weather will change anyway. Um, so, you, you want to teach kids this very, very young. Kids need to feel heard too, and kids don't. How many times do we jerk our kids around and, you know, come on, you're too slow, let's go, you know, nah, 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 nah. and we don't treat them like they're people. They are, and, and it's really important to speak to your children with the same respect that you wish to be spoken to yourself. And this is where they learn it. You know, acorn does not fall far from the oak tree. So if your kids are being sassy, snarky, and nasty and calling everybody asshole and fuckers, guess what? They probably learned it at home. So yeah, you want to make sure to teach respect to your kids. You have to be respectful to your children and your children have to be respectful to you. It is a two way street and kids do learn from watching us. Absa freaking Lily. They are little tiny sponges and they just suck up everything that we teach them and we teach them by example. So that's why it is so very important to be very, very respectful to your own children and make sure that they are respectful to you. So yeah, it's a thing. Everyone needs to hear you amazing. <laughs> Good. Okay. Um, okay. So kids need to be heard. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Kids need to be heard. The worst thing that my dad used to say to me, and remember my dad was an abuser. My dad was a uh, malignant, uh, borderline had very expressive through narcissism and he was probably both, but he was definitely borderline, but he also expressed a lot of narcissism. And one of the things he would constantly tell us, you know, my sisters and I is that, you know, children, women and children were to be seen and not heard. And further than that, women were supposed to be barefoot and pregnant. Oh, Jesus, God. Don't even get me started. Anyway, so his communication to us was shut the hell up. I don't want to hear it. 
And then he wondered why none of us liked him. So yes, it, children definitely need to be heard. They're human beings. They're just little human beings. So it's really, really important to listen to them and let them know that what they are saying is important for a couple of reasons. One, you want to empower your child. You want to make sure that they know how to communicate clearly for a couple of reasons. One, if you let them know that they're heard and people believe them, they are less likely to be targeted by predators. abso freaking lutely And two, they're less likely to get involved with abusers of any kind. Uh, oh, you stated you should state your emotion. What if you feel the person you communicate will exploit that information? Okay, you must have not tuned in earlier because what I said earlier was if you are dealing with a narcissist, if you are dealing with an abuser, if you are dealing with any of these people, none of these rules apply. None of these rules apply. And I'm going to get to that right now because I'll forget otherwise. Okay. Thank you for bringing that up. Okay. So in healthy, normal communication, you want to be open and honest, right? You want to do the reflective listening. You want to um, have that kind of good communication. You want to make sure that you're heard, that your partner is heard, that your kids are heard, that everybody is feeling respected. Now, if you are dealing ugh, with an abuser, with a malignant narcissist, with a malignant borderline, with a psychopath, with a dark triad, with any of those, your communication style is going to be completely different. It is impossible to have a healthy discussion with, hi Bella, with somebody who is uh, uh, an abuser, period. Um, if you feel that they are going to exploit you, don't give them any information. What you're going to do is something called gray rock or... <laughs> Oh no, thank you, oh, oh, not, not now people, not now. Um, so you're gonna do something called, oh, he's barking at the ground, he's a little senile, I'm sorry. Um, so you're gonna do something called, <laughs> best, best laid plans of mice and men. Um, so you're gonna do something called gray rock and in gray rock you give them nothing, like nothing. So, um, People who are abusive love to do word salad, and that's why reflective listening won't work because you'll start to reflect back to them what you heard them say, and they'll change their story. So reflective listening will not, will not work with a malignant narcissist or a malignant borderline or a psychopath or a, um, an abuser of any kind. Um, so you do not want to tell any of those people what your true feelings are. Absolutely not, because they will use it against you. Absolutely, they will absolutely turn that stuff around and use it against you. I'm talking mostly tonight about healthy communication. The reason I want to talk about the healthy communication is because when we're in an abusive relationship, we pick up all of these really bad habits from our abuser and we pick up all these fleas. And we don't know when we come out of uh, an abusive relationship, we really, where did you go? Ah, there it is. Who wants to know what word salad is? Oh, on that. I'm sorry, word salad. Uh, word salad. So how do I explain word salad? They just start throwing out a whole bunch of different topics. So it, it, Richie did a really good video on it. And the way he described it is a little different than the way I would describe it, but it's very similar. So what somebody who's doing word salad is, is that they'll just start throwing in stuff from the past. They'll mix up stuff that you've argued about already. They'll throw in stuff from the present, they'll bring in stuff from the future that has not happened yet, but they will not differentiate about what the hell they're talking about. So it's kind of like you're trying to follow this train of thought and you're like, wait a minute, you're talking about something that happened two years, but you're mad at me now because it, but, and then you're saying something in the future. What, what are you talking about? That's word salad. So it's like, it's, yeah, it's a constant circling of the conversation, constant circling of the conversation. It's kind of like the way Richie described it. He, he was like, um, you know, if you say, uh, if you say to your, your abuser, you know, please stop spending all this money because abusers often like to spend people's money. Um, and they'll, they'll go off on a tangent and do something like, well, you like to spend money. It's okay for me to spend money because you like to spend money. Why can't I spend money? It's, everybody likes to spend money. I like to spend money. Your, your neighbor down the street likes to spend money. How come I can't spend, you know, it's just really what? crazy go nuts. So, um, is it deflection? Somebody was asking if it, it's yeah, it's a for, it's a form of deflection. Absolutely. Well, because they're trying trying to throw you off track. If you're if you're confronting them about something, 
and you got them dead to rights, they're going to throw in word salad like nobody's business. They're going to drag up the past, the future, the present, the whole thing. Well, everybody likes to do it. How come? Da, 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 da. Because they're trying to throw you off to get you confused, to get you into that cognitive dissonance. So you will stop nailing them for the bad behavior that they themselves are doing because that also gives them a chance to keep thinking about how they can twist it and turn it around and make it all your fault. So it's all about confusing. So it's confusing. all about confusing you. It is. It is absolutely about cognitive dissonance. Absolutely is about confusing you. It is about trying to, it is getting darker and darker. Oh my God. Good thing we ordered those lights. <laughs> of course, they're not here today. But <laughs> oh well. Um, okay. So healthy communication. Sorry. It's like choo-choo train went off the tracks. Um, healthy communication is important to know when you're a survivor of abuse because we have picked up all of these crazy, um, you know, uh, things, fleas. We picked up all these fleas, all these bad behaviors that we've gotten from our abuser and we don't know how to communicate and we're used to word salad and we're used to not listening and we're used to screaming rages and we're used to you know, illogical, mean, narc, snarky, nasty, name calling, yada, yada, yada. None of that is in a healthy relationship. So when somebody who's been in an abusive relationship gets into a healthy relationship, it feels weird. It does. It really, you just, mm, yeah, you're just kind of like, well, wait a minute. How come you're not yelling at me? How come you're not calling me names? Why are you making sense? How come, how come you're being nice to me? Why are, why aren't you doing what my other person did? So yeah, so we don't know how to behave, which is why I'm saying what constitutes healthy communication versus unhealthy communication. So yeah, when you're dealing with somebody who is an abuser, you absolutely do not want to let them know what you are thinking, feeling, or anything. You want to go gray rock. So gray rock is when you give them nothing. So for example, um, I had a a very nasty personality disordered client that came in and every time he would come in, he would call me an asshole. <laughs> and I was like, okay. So, but I gave him nothing. I didn't respond. I didn't react. I didn't, you know, it was like, so how are you feeling? What do you want to work on today? You know, like nothing. Like I didn't give him like the Jesus Christ, dude, what the fuck is wrong with you? If I'd done that, he would have been off and running. Do you see what I'm saying? So you can't do that. You can't give them what they're looking for. So remember, people with a personality disorder who are malignant, and remember, I'm talking about the extreme end of the spectrum. I'm not talking about little traits up. I am talking about abusers here, guys. So when somebody does something to poke the bear, you don't want to give them anything because people with personality disorders on the malignant end of the spectrum, they will take any uh, attention, whether it is positive or negative and soak it up. And that is exactly what they want. So you do not give it to them. You don't, you just, it's like, Oh, okay. Well, yeah. Next, <laughs> you know, you give them nothing. So yeah, you don't want to give them anything. You don't want to give them vital information. When you do get into a healthy relationship though, and you know, it's a healthy relationship, you are going to need to learn how to communicate with your partner in a way different way than you communicated with your abuser. And that means reflective listening. That means sharing of emotions. Okay, back to that. That's where I lost track. Okay, so what we don't know was, um, it, it was like, uh, what was what was your mom's communication like considering she had children with your abusive dad, if you don't mind me asking. My mom had a lot of traits of um, borderline. Her mother, my grandmother, was a flat out malignant malignant narcissist. I mean, she was just hideous. Nobody in the family liked her. She was mean. She was cruel. She was nasty. And it's no wonder my mother married my dad. I mean, if you look at that dynamic, you're just like, holy sh**. My mother's communication with us was always uh, kind. She was always kind to us. She was not mean and nasty and snarky and, and stuff like that. But because she had traits of the borderline, she was always in competition with us and she would occasionally sabotage and she would occasionally, you know, say things that were not nice, not, not as often as my dad, but you know, she was a little nice. She was a lot nicer than my dad. So, um, 
hope that answered the question. She had traits of borderline. The nice thing about my mom is, is that once I grew up and I started researching and understanding what all this was, you know, she and I, after my dad died, had a total come to Jesus. And I mean like a freaking come to Jesus. And she started reading books and got it. So, so by the time she died, which was this last November, she and I had a really good relationship. So, but it took a long time. You bet. Um, okay. What was I talking about? <laughs> Oh God, I've lost my mind. Uh, I'm saying something really important and I cannot remember what it is. Okay, we get out of a bad relationship. We don't know how to talk. We don't know how to um, how to be with another person because it feels weird to us. So in a healthy communication, a healthy relationship, there is the reflective listening. There is the emotion, naming the emotion. That's it. Must be important because I keep getting hung up on that one. Okay. So naming the emotion is very, very important. So if you're angry, okay, I want you guys to wrap your heads around this one. Anger is not a pure emotion. Love is love. Lust is lust. Happy is happy. Sad is sad. Anger is always, and I mean always, based in fear. Always. It's part of the fight, flight, or freeze syndrome. So think of it this way. Here's our amygdala. Okay, here's our brain. <laughs> Left side, right side. Here's our amygdala. Amygdala is about, it's a little, it's about, it looks like an almond. It's an almond shaped organ. It sits about an inch inside of each ear. Okay, so this guy is responsible for our fight, flight, or freeze center. Now, when we have been in an abusive relationship, this thing starts growing. It, it, it gets very strong because we're using it because we have CPTSD. We, we are, are definitely being terrorized. We're being abused and this thing is strong. And what it does is it shrinks the hippocampus and the hypothalamus, which are responsible for short-term to long-term memory, okay? So when the amygdala perceives a threat, now the problem with the amygdala, and I've talked about it before and I'm gonna talk about it again, the amygdala is stupid, like three O's stupid, like stupid. It cannot tell the difference between a real threat, like, oh my God, you know, uh, getting mugged on, I don't know, in New York in 1970, or, you know, a thought about getting mugged in New York in 1970, or an emotional threat, honey, I'm going to leave you for the muggers next door. It's all the same. It's like, shush, you shush. Um, it's all the same. The amygdala cannot tell the difference between a real threat, an imagined threat, an emotional threat, or an imagined emotional threat. It's all the same. So the amygdala goes, ah, red alert, we're dying, tells these guys to send off a distress signal to the rest of the body to release cortisol. We release cortisol, it's our stress hormone. We tense up, we stop breathing, we start taking these little teeny tiny breaths that don't go anywhere, and pretty soon our body is flooded with CO2. That tells another part of the brain down here on the reptilian part, holy shit, we're gonna die, there's no oxygen. Okay, adrenal glands, yeah, I said it right this time. Okay, adrenal glands, release the adrenaline. <clears throat> so we release the adrenaline. At this point, the body either goes into, bam, full-blown panic attack, which is the, <gasps> oh my God, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die, I'm gonna die, I'm having a heart attack, right? That's a panic attack. Or it goes into, bam, rage attack, and you turn into the incredible either Hulk or She-Hulk. So, anger is always based in fear, always. John, my beloved husband, has learned that when I get angry, his first question to me is, what are you afraid of? And at that point, I usually go, oh shit, <laughs> what am I afraid of? And then I have to figure it out. So anger is always based in fear, always. You want to name the emotions because your partner is not a mind reader. And this is the other thing that drives me crazy. When I have clients sitting on my couch, they will demand or expect that their partner can read their mind or that you should know this. You should know this. You've been with me for 20 years. You should. You should know this. Well, guess what? You're shooting all over your relationship. Stop it. Stop it. You shouldn't know it because we're not mind readers. Sweetheart, if we were mind readers, I would have won that goddamn lottery that just happened. Seriously. None of us would be here. We'd all be in the Bahamas. Or maybe not the Bahamas. I've heard it's kind of gross. We'd be somewhere nice. Like, I don't know. Costa Rica. Anyway, the point being, or Hawaii, I don't know. Anyway, the point being is, is that we're not mind readers. And, and we should know that. Well, you should know. Well, that's a great way to make a person wrong. And that's a great way to kill your relationship. Stop it. Stop shooting all over your relationship. Stop shooting all over yourself. So we're not mind readers. And that's why you need to actually say 
things. I am feeling sad about the behavior. What the mistake that we make though is that we say I am sad that you, that you, you are this, you are that bad behavior as opposed to I am sad that this bad behavior happened. It makes me feel or I feel it doesn't make me feel but I feel sad or disrespected or unhappy or scared or whatever or angry or whatever. So we need to name our emotions so our partner knows exactly where we're coming from. And if we are angry, we need to own that yes, we're angry, but underneath that anger is fear. So what is the fear? And if your partner is angry with you, that is the first question to ask them. What are you afraid of? What is the threat? How did this amygdala get stimulated to the point where you feel threatened? What is going on? So you always want to come at it in a soft way. So the problem with a lot of couples that I see is that there are a lot of impatience. <laughs> it's like, what do we want? Patience. When do we want it? Now. So you've got to have patience and you've got to approach talking to your spouse about difficult stop topics gently. Gently, just like you would want somebody to come at you with something. So oftentimes when spouses are confronted with information that is difficult to hear, they feel attacked and then they shut down. And then, you know, the spouse is, you know, one spouse is like, Argh! and the other one is like, and, you know, running away. So you always want to approach things, like I said, with the reverse Oreo cookie, soft stuff, letting them know we're going to talk about something difficult, but it's not that you don't love them. You're doing this because you want the relationship to be better, diving into the hard criticism or whatever it is you need to talk about, coming back out on the positive takeaway. Thank you for listening to me. You know, please let me know what you think. What did you, what do you, you know, what did you hear me say kind of thing? Um, so you always want to approach it like, uh, like a detective. You know, help me understand. It's, this is going to sound terrible, but you know, help me help you kind of thing. You know, it's like, help me understand where this is coming from, where this anger is coming from. What What's the fear that's driving it? Help me understand so I can be on the same page. Because that's what you guys want. You want to be on the same page. You don't want to be, you know, disconnected. So always approach things with gentle, 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 the way you would like to be approached as well. Um, okay, so timeouts. Let's talk about timeouts. Okay, so I was talking about when one partner shuts down because the partner has come at them, right? So, and then the other partner runs away, and then this partner gets pissed off and pursues, and this one keeps running, and this one pursues, and this one keeps running, and this one pursues, and this one keeps running, and this one pursues. So that is a common problem in relationships. If that is what is going on in your relationship, congratulations, you're normal. So, <laughs> but it's got to stop because it's not working. It's not a healthy thing to do because it leaves both parties feeling frustrated. The one who is shutting down is feeling threatened. The one who is pursuing has generally got a ginormous amount of anxiety. And that's why they're pursuing because they want an answer now, 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 because they need to soothe. They need to self-soothe or they need to have some soothing going on. And when their partner shuts down and says, I don't know, and can't give them an answer and they keep pursuing and demanding, and this one keeps pulling away, their anxiety level is through the damn roof. So the pursuer pursued has got to kind of come to the middle. So in other words, the person who wants to shut down has got to stop shutting down. And the person who wants to pursue has got to stop pursuing. Easier said than done, but you can do it. And it takes consciousness. It takes mindfulness. You have to be aware of that. Is that what you're doing? You know, is that what generally happens in your arguments that you have? And, and here's the other thing I want to make crystal clear, healthy relationships, healthy relationships do not have screaming fights ever. I can count on one finger, one time that John and I screamed at each other. And that was early on in our relationship. One time. So 20, how, how many years have we been together now? Grand total 25, 26, something like that. Yeah. 26 years together, one time. So healthy relationships do not have screaming matches. They don't, they do not have drama. They do not. And anybody who tells you that they do is an abuser. They're trying to convince you that that is normal. That is not normal. Absolutely not. Are you going to have disagreements? Oh, you bet your sweet bippy. John and I have disagreements all the time, but we do not scream at each other because we respect each other and we listen to each other and we make sure that the other partner is feeling heard. 
because the when people get into screaming matches is because they're not feeling heard and so they get louder and louder and louder because they're not feeling heard and they think if they scream or they yell they're going to be heard nope if, if you're in a relationship where that's going on it's probably abuse going on and that's not good so um yeah no drama no drama in healthy relationships absolutely not and anybody who tells you there is drama is probably in an abusive relationship themselves and their abuser is trying to convince them of that craziness um you're gonna bark at the floor again aren't you um so okay timeouts ah timeouts that's where i was going so in a healthy relationship you can call a timeout so in other words let's say you're practicing this you're new to this this is you know reflective listening is new the the stop pursuing and per, you know running away is all new and you're having a disagreement it's turning into an argument it's starting to get a little loud and you know exactly where this is going to end right you do not want it to get to that point so what you want to do is as soon as you recognize that the argument or the disagreement is turning into something you know nasty and it's going to end badly and you know exactly how it's going to end call a time out now I have seen people try to abuse the timeouts um, and you don't want to do that so when you call a timeout here's the deal when a timeout is called the subject is completely and totally dropped absolutely dropped no last little fuck you's no last little zingers no nothing it is dropped so the timeout is called and then the person who called the timeout goes to their partner and either holds their hand and looks in their eyes or just looks them in the eyes if you're not comfortable holding hands and says, hey, we are disagreeing right now. This argument is really familiar. I do not want it to end the way it has ended the last hundred times. I'm calling a timeout. I'm gonna take five minutes, 10 minutes, half an hour, no more than a half an hour. Why? Because your other partner is sitting there going, ha ah. ha. <laughs> I want to finish this because I'm really filled with anxiety. Do you see what I'm saying? So you don't want to take any more than a half an hour and you want to name how much time you're going to take and then you honor that because the other person is waiting to finish this discussion. So, hey, I'm going to take half an hour. I'm going to go grab some water. I'm going to go journal. I'm going to go walk around the block. I'm going to go out to my punching bag. I'm going to whatever. You let them know that you're not just storming out of the house and leaving. There is nothing worse than a, an argument that happens when somebody calls a timeout and they just fucking leave without, you know, like leave the house because then that leaves the partner that has a great deal of anxiety, usually holding the emotional bag going, are they coming back? Are we divorced? What the actual fuck is going on? I don't know. So yeah, you want to let them know, hey, I'm going to go grab a glass of water. I'm going to go for a walk. I'm going to go for a drive. I'm going to, you know, go punch the punching bag. I'm going to do something. And then you honor that. And in that time period that you've given them, five minutes, 10 minutes, half an hour, whatever you've decided, no more than a half an hour. Then you come back and you go, okay, it's it's been a half an hour. I've gotten the water. Are you okay? Are you ready to start? Let's try this again. And then you start again and you try to resolve it and you call as many timeouts as you need. Now, you cannot call a timeout to shut down your partner. I have seen people do that. Don't do that. That's no, don't do that. If you're calling a timeout, it is because it is too heated. It is going in a direction that you know exactly where it's going to end and it's not going to end well. And you don't want it to do that. You're not calling a timeout to be like timeout, timeout. You know, you need to hear me, you know, uh, -uh. nope. If you're calling a timeout, it is a timeout dropped completely. I love you. I'm going to take 15 minutes. I'm going to go grab some water. I'm going to punch the punching bag or I'm going to write stuff out. I'm going to be back in 15 minutes. I might leave the house. So just to let you know, I will be back. Because that's the worst thing that anybody can do, like I said, is just storm out of the house and not tell your partner you're coming back. That's not fair. That's that's manipulative. Don't do that. So um, that's how you do a timeout, is you call the timeout. It is completely dropped. You let your partner know you love them. You're just having a disagreement. You will get this resolved. You'll be back in 15, 20 minutes, 30 minutes at the most. And then you honor that. Come back. Try again. Now, if you are at the end of the night, and nothing is getting resolved. It's just, it's, you keep having to call timeouts. It's not getting resolved. There's a lot of emotion on it. A lot of, you know, a lot of intense feelings. Then you call the final timeout. And that's usually when you, your brain is done. Your brain is done. You cannot think anymore. And you go, babe, this is the final timeout for tonight. So again, you make eye contact with them. If you can hold their hands. I love you. We are just not agreeing. 
we're just not agreeing and we can't seem to come to a resolution tonight. I cannot argue anymore tonight. My brain is toast and I don't want to go to the point where I'm going to say something that I'm going to regret because I don't want to hurt you and I don't want to hurt us. So let's call this the final timeout. We'll try again tomorrow morning. And you remind each other we're on the same page. I do love you. It's just that we're disagreeing right now. We will find a solution to this, just not tonight. And then you go to bed. Now here's the part that most couples hate me for. And then you cuddle, even if you don't want to. Yeah. You know why? Oxytocin. Oxytocin. Bonding chemical. It's going to help remind you guys why you're a couple. And now here's the most important thing. This is the difference between a healthy relationship and an abusive relationship. In an abusive relationship, the egos always win. Always. In an abusive relationship, the egos always win. Get your fucking ego out of the goddamn way. If your ego is saying, oh, 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 why, why do I have to let the subject drop? And uh, why do I have to cuddle? And uh, what? Why does your ego sound like Richard Nixon? I know. Like, oh, I'm not a crook. <laughs> well, because egos are crooks. Egos are crooks, man. I'm telling you. Of course, all the younger kids out there are like, who's Richard Nixon? <laughs> but <laughs> I just dated myself. Um, so yeah, that did kind of sound like Richard Nixon. <laughs> so yeah, egos are crooks, man. They are. They're just, they're bad juju, man. So get your ego out of the way. Your ego is going to destroy your relationship. Get the ego out of the way. You don't always have to be right. So it's okay to let the ego go bye bye Kill your ego. Kill your ego. Egos are the ones that drive that need to be right and the one that always says, well, why do I have to change? Well, how come I have to do something different? So here's something to wrap your head around. When you're in a relationship and it's not working, it's like, you know, and the communication is not good. You got to do something different in order to have change happen. Change is not going to happen if you keep doing the same thing. In order to have something different happen, you have to do something differently. It's like the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over and over and over again, expecting a different outcome. It's not going to happen. So I oftentimes have one or both members of the couple tell me, well, why do I have to change? Why do I have to work on my communication? Shouldn't they be working? Well, yeah, they can. They should. But if they're not, you need to do something different. Guess what? It's you. Have fun. You know, and so then they're like, well, and then I can hear the ego come up and the ego is like, well, why should I have to do that? They should change and da 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 Well, at the moment, they're not sitting in front of me. You are. So guess what? We can only work with you. So let's work with you. <laughs> so, so you get the ego out of the way and things change. Now, here's the thing. When one partner starts changing their behavior, what is going to happen is the other partner is going to notice. And the other partner is going to do one of two things or maybe a combination of noticing that the change is happening and going, wait a minute, why are you arguing with me the way you normally do? What the hell is going on? And they'll either push back on that and try to provoke more to get you to respond in the way you used to, or they'll go, wait a minute, you're not arguing with me. Why are you doing things? To I like the way you're doing this. Okay, let's talk. <laughs> you know, change will Happen. Now, with the one who tries to provoke more, usually it's, it's resistance on their part because it's different. It's change. You're not you're not responding the way you used to. You're not calling them asshole or bitch or cunt or anything else nasty or mean. You're using the reflective listing. You're doing the timeouts. You're keeping a check on your emotions. You chucked your ego out the door. They're going to be forced to change in some way, shape, or form either for good or for bad. So they're either going to get it. It's like the light bulb will come on and they'll be like, oh, this is a much better way of communicating. Or if they are drama driven, they will keep poking and poking and poking and poking and poking, trying to get you to return back to the way that you used to argue, if that makes any sort of sense. And that's usually what ends up happening in abusive relationships. So, um, so, but, and even in healthy relationships, if the person did not have a good upbringing or a good role model for how to have a healthy conversation or, or communication, they'll, pu they'll push back. But if it continues past, you know, a month or so of you doing the new behavior, there's something else going on, if that makes any sort of sense. Okay, so I've talked about reflective listening. I've talked about timeouts, dealing with difficult people. Okay, so I kind of touched on it with the gray rock. So I had a, a question earlier on YouTube from uh, a listener who was asking me about confronting their abuser. Like, 
Um, they were talking about the discard phase and the smear campaign. Wow, I am really running out of light here. That's crazy. Um, talking about the discard phase and the smear campaign and if it does any good to uh, try to hold the abuser, if you've already left the abusive relationship, if it does any good to try to hold the abuser accountable for their actions, no, 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 absolutely not. Don't do it. The best thing you can do is go absolutely no contact because here's the thing. Again, it goes back to narcissistic supply. Abusers would rather have a fucked up, dysfunctional, anger-laden, nasty relationship with somebody than no relationship at all. Because it's their weird ego thing. It's their weird way of thinking. It's their, it's their need for control. And they would rather have negative attention than no attention at all. So the worst thing you could do to an abuser is to absolutely give them no attention whatsoever because now they don't have any eco supply. What are they going to do? They're going to have to go find it from somebody else. Even if you give them the negative supply, even if you point out their behavior and try to hold them accountable, because here's the thing, they're never going to accept it. They're never going to, they're never going to take responsibility for what they have done ever, ever. They're the ultimate victims. That's, that's not their thing. A normal person would, you know, if I've hurt somebody, here's the thing. A healthy, normal person knows when they've harmed somebody. A healthy, normal person would want to make amends. These people are not healthy and they are not normal. So do not treat them as if they are. They're not. So don't try to hold them accountable. Don't try to get justice. Don't try to, and I don't mean justice like if you're in a divorce case and you've got kids in custody and things like that. Yes, by all means, do what you need to do with your lawyer. But if you have just been dating somebody, or with somebody and they're an abuser and you're trying to show the world how crazy they are instead of you, don't do it. It's always going to backfire on you. Remember, the narcissists are manipulative. They will lie. They will cheat. They will steal. They will do whatever it takes in order for them to be okay. And that means they'll smear you to anybody and they will make it sound real. And the more you try to point out how crazy they are and how what they've done, the crazier you are going to sound. The best response to these people is cricket chirping. Like seriously, like just dead silence. Because what can they do? It's like, it's like in Kung Fu. So in Kung Fu, if you give your opponent a, a solid target to hit, they're going to keep hitting because there's something to hit again. If you become a paper bag in the wind and they come in to hit you and you just turn sideways, they go sailing past you. And then they stop fighting you because you just keep turning sideways and they go sailing past you. So it's the same thing. It's the same principle. You don't want to give them a target to hit. You just stop. It's like, let them, let them do their smear campaign. So what? Who cares? It doesn't matter. It doesn't. What matters is what you think of you. And quite frankly, your friends already know who you are and your true family already knows who you are. So don't worry about the smear campaign and stop trying to, um, to hold them accountable because it will never happen. Okay, so do we have any questions that I missed? Did I miss any questions? Have I got everything? Are there Thank any? You. you already talked about how to practice, like like for instance, some of the stuff we do with questions or some of the things we ask each other at night. Or things, oh, things that people oh, can do oh, to improve their communication. Yes, things that people can do to improve their communication. So there is a wonderful, uh, I love the Elephant Journal and it's a, it's a Buddhist uh, Facebook page and I love to pull stuff off of there. And there was one on there that was 33 questions, 36 questions to ask your mate. I can't remember what the number was, but anyway, 33 or 36 questions to ask your intimate partner. And so every night you just pick a new intimate question and it's things like, you know, what do I do that annoys you? Or um, tell me a part of my body that you really love. Uh, and then you, you answer it for each other. You, you talk to each other and that's a great way to keep the communication going. The saddest thing that I see in healthy relationships, the way that healthy relationships become unhealthy is when people start taking each other for granted. Really don't take each other for granted. You really never know when your partner is not going to be there. So don't do it. So healthy communication is super important. And the thing that we forget, Thank you, John. That's what I forgot. The thing that we forget, which I just forgot that I now remembered is, uh, positive rewards, positive, I mean, positive rewards, but positive, um, affirmations, positive affirmations. So there's a wonderful book called the five love languages. Um, again, I don't know who wrote it, but there's the five love languages. So there's, um, there's words of affirmation, which is, you know, I love you. Thank you for doing the dishes. You're awesome. Uh, acts of service, um, you know, doing the dishes, things like that. 
uh, physical touch, quality time, and gift giving. So those are the five love languages. We tend to vary between them, but we tend to have one, maybe two that are more, more our love language than the others. So if your love language is physical touch, but Gary, you're Gary Chapman, Gary Chapman, Gary Chapman, five love languages. So if your love language is physical touch, but your partner's is words of affirmation and you never give your partner words of affirmation, like, thank you. I see what you do for this relationship. That really means a lot to me. If you never do that to them, they're not ever going to feel loved, even though you're giving them physical touch, like nobody's business and vice versa. So if the person whose love language is um, words of affirmation, but they never touch you, you're not going to feel loved. So it's really important. Remember that there's more to communication than just speaking. It's body language. It's what is our love language? How do we know that we're loved? How do we know that our partner is feeling loved? So every night what I do, and one good way to practice uh, reflective listening is to do three positive affirmations for your partner every night before going to bed. What a great way to end the day. You know, you say things, you grab their hands, you look them in the eyes and you say, I love your eyes. I love how kind you are. I love the way you do the dishes. Apparently dishes are a thing for me. I love the way you mow the lawn. I love um, the vacations that we take. I love how sweet and gentle you are. I love how sexy you are. I love, you know, you just start doing affirmations and then stick to three because they're not going to remember the whole thing. And then um, have them reflect back what they heard you say. And then they do it for you and you reflect back what you heard them say. So that's a lovely way to, to practice reflective listening. And that makes sure that each partner knows that they are loved. So that's that's a great way to end the day. I love doing that. And it's it's just lovely. <laughs> and remember, body language is huge. So what I really hate is, especially my younger clients, they love to text. They love to text. I fucking hate texting. Here's the reason why. You hush. Yes, I know I'm old. Shut up. So <laughs> I hate texting and I hate email. And here's the reason why. We are visual. We look for micro facial expressions. We do. We look to see what that person is doing body language wise. How are they holding themselves? Are they open? Are they closed? Are they angry? Are they scared? Are they, you know, we look for all of that. And when we've got text messaging, we take the emotion out of it. And now we're left with that filter that may be clogged with all that stuff from a previous relationship, family of origin, whatever that is, and we tend to read into it. So in other words, the, the message could be something as simple as, hey, what's for dinner? But if you're having a bad day and you had a, an abusive spouse prior to that, it could be very accusatory. <sighs> what's for dinner? You know, whoa, totally different than, hey, I'm starving, what's for dinner? Do you see what I'm saying? So. Um, can two people with CPTSD be partnered in a healthy way? Yes, as long as you are working on the CPTSD. Absolutely. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. Just make sure that you're working on it. There's a great book by uh, Pete Walker. Shush. Pete Walker uh, called uh, CPTSD from Surviving to Thriving. And yeah, absolutely. You can both have PTSD, CPTSD, and, and have a healthy relationship as long as you are working on the symptoms that are driving you crazy. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Um, oh Lord, brain gone. What was I saying? I was talking about texting. Kids. Oh, texting. Right. So you don't want to text. I hate texting. I hate it because you read into it and you put stuff onto it. That's not necessarily there. So if the concept is more intricate than hi, I love you. Just thinking about you. Pick up the phone and call because at least with a phone call, you can get that vocal intonation and you know exactly what they're, how they're saying things because you can read things as being sarcastic that are not. So it's really, really important that you pay attention to how you say it. And, and here's the other thing. I hate it when clients come in and they're like, let me show you the text. And it's a freaking gone with the wind novel. I'm like, no people, no, no. If you're going to be having an argument, do it in person. So you can see the facial expressions, you can hear the vocal intonations, and you can make sure to check whether you are filtering things through your filter. Yeah. Oops. Okay. So that is, that is that. So I don't like texting. If you're, if you're going to text, keep it short and make sure that it's crystal clear in what you are saying, especially if you have a, a partner that has got a lot of anxiety. So, um, 
So you want to, you want to do that. Um, yeah, I know, I know, I do, I know people who do that too. So yeah, so they write novels and they have arguments back and forth and there's always this miscommunication. I can guarantee you nine out of 10 arguments over text are absolutely in your own head. It's usually when we start pulling them apart and start working on them, it's like, that's not what I meant. Well, but that's how I took it. Well, that's not what I said. That's not what I meant. You know, that's usually the way it goes, which is why I'm saying don't do it. Pick up the phone and call. That is the best way to have a discussion or a disagreement because, like I said, you get to read the person's facial expressions and vocal intonations, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, I am running out of light, so <laughs> I'm going to shut it down for tonight. So remember, uh, I am doing the um, Bradshaw Mountain Inn, Bradshaw Mountain Guest Ranch uh, Women's Yoga Retreat in Crown King, Arizona on September 22nd, 23rd, and 24th. I will be there the night of the 23rd to do a uh, lecture on women's health topics. And one of them is going to be communication. It's going to probably be anxiety and depression. Whatever is up for the audience, I will talk about it. Um, and then September 30th, Richie Granin and I will be doing um, the, uh, the seminar at the uh, Tempe Women's Club, and it is open to anybody, male, female, doesn't matter. Um, it's at 1290 South Mill. That will be on September 30th. We are not charging for it. We are asking for a donation of a non-perishable food item that we can then donate to the St. Mary's Food Bank, which I think would be awesome. There's 135 seats, so it is first come, first seated. Um, we're going to have uh, pens and paper ready so that you can write down questions in case you don't want to be on camera because I'm going to have it filmed from the back so nobody's face is going to be seen just in case there's anybody that's an abuser that's watching that thing. So, um, well, you, you know, we can write down the, the um, uh, questions and then I'll, Richie and I will get them and then we can answer them, that type of thing. Um, yes, Spartan Life Coach. He's, I love him. He's awesome. He's, he's, I'm so excited. I can't, I'm for Clint here. So anyway, so that's that. September 30th, doors will open at 6.30 and um, limited seating, but come on down. So there's that. All right. I cannot think of anything else. Next week's show is going to be on what is love? What is love? Because I don't think people have a really clear idea of what love is. I think we've got this romanticized idea of it that we've been fed through, you know, romance novels and. You know, I have what is love, baby. baby don't hurt me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought that too. <laughs> so yeah, we have this romance novel idea, and also we get confused with infatuation. So there is a difference between real love, true love, love to love and um, infatuation. I just went to the Princess Bride. I went from one comedy to another. Um, so I want to talk about that. So get your questions ready on what is love? And we're going to talk about the difference between real love, infatuation, you know, et cetera, et cetera, the difference between romance novels and real life. What, baby? It's, really dark. it's getting dark. Okay, I'm going to go. All right, guys, have a great day, and uh, I will talk to you later. Bye.